All right, good evening and welcome back to our midweek Bible study at the Salina Church of Christ. Uh, we will continue this for the time being. Uh, we have uh, started our worship services uh, this past Sunday. We had our worship service at 10 a.m. Uh, for those of you who uh, were not with us this past Sunday, I uh, just want to, to let everybody know that we are following social distancing protocol as far as uh, churches are concerned and we have uh, space in between people and there was more than enough room this past Sunday uh, if you're kind of on the the borderline uh, just know that there was enough room and and there's still seating available in Bob uh, for anyone who would like to sit out there I know some people who might be uh, just listening over the phone, although I guess you wouldn't be seeing this if you're just listening over the phone, but you might let people know if they're just listening on the phone uh, on Sunday mornings and they could come if they would like and sit in Bob and at least be able to see the, the live stream. Uh, however, you know, just uh, use your own wisdom as far as anyone who might be at risk or anyone who might be sick and, and, and please just be considerate of others. Tonight we will begin our study of the book of Colossians. We concluded the book of Philippians last week. And, and so this evening we will just be doing an introduction to the book of Colossians, not getting into uh, the book itself, but just a brief overview of who wrote the book and why it was written and so forth. So we'll go ahead and begin by reading uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, as we ask the question, who wrote the book? Uh, it says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Uh, verse number two, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So the author of the book, credit is given to Paul. Uh, as Paul begins to write this letter, of course, anytime we say that the letter was written by Paul, uh, then we have to understand that the author of the letter was, of course, the Holy Spirit. Uh, as Paul states there in verse number one, uh, by the will of God. Not only that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, but that this message is being sent by the will of God as well. So similar to the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians is considered a prison epistle. Uh, one uh, penned by Paul while he was in prison. Uh, the date of this, as we ask the question, when was it written? Uh, the, the date of the authorship of this letter was around the 60 to 63 A.D. range, around the same time that Paul wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, prior to the time when he uh, wrote the letter to the Philippian brethren. All right, so as we look at verse number 2, we ask the question, to whom was it written? It says, to the saints... And faithful brethren in Christ who are at Col Colossae, uh, grace to you. I don't know why I'm having such a difficult time with that word. Uh, Col Col Colossians, Colossae. Uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Uh, this was written to the congregation who meets there at Colossae. Uh, the, the actual city of Colossae is about the middle uh, of modern day Turkey. If you were to pull up your, your New Testament era map, uh, you would see that it was close to the, the cities that, that are written to in the book of Revelation. Uh, the cities such as Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All of those cities are there uh, within the region of modern-day Turkey. Uh, Colossae was more towards uh, the central of Turkey, while the others were closer to the to the sea, uh, and it is written to the saints, uh, those people who have been set apart by their obedience to the gospel who are at Colossae. Uh, not only does he say to the saints, but also to the faithful brethren who are there at Colossae. Uh, this is not just to people. We don't like to, there, there's not a, a classification of Christian, but Paul is writing this to those individuals who are faithful. Again, this is uh, important for us to understand as we look at the things written to those individuals. It's not about what they need to do in order to be saved. They've already uh, obeyed the gospel. They've already repented of their sins, been immersed for, 
the repentance or for the forgiveness of those sins. Uh, and, and this is written to people who are uh, living faithfully. However, as we continue on through the book, we see that there are dangers that they are having to deal with. And so Paul, as he writes this letter to the church at Colossae, he's going to, you know, we, we understand there are some uh, things that are written that we consider milk and some things that are meat. And Paul is going to put some meat on the table for these brethren and is going to take those individuals who are faithful to spread the word uh, and to make sure that these things are put into action there at the church. Uh, something unique about this letter in the church at Colossae uh, is that this is a congregation that Paul had not been to. Uh, it wasn't one that, that he had physically established. It wasn't one that he had visited. And so as you keep that in mind, as we look at, at other books written by Paul, say to the church at Corinth and, and, and to those people who he had close relationships with, uh, the individuals who are there at Colossae, uh, don't know Paul personally. And so through part of this book, he is going to be uh, building that relationship so that they can appreciate who he is and, and where he is coming from. For the remainder of our time, the majority of our time this evening, we're going to be looking at why the book was written. Uh, this letter was written largely to deal with some false teaching that had crept into the church at Colossae regarding the deity of of Christ. Before we get into anything, just the an important thing to, to pick up from that is that it is important what we teach. Our doctrine is important. Uh, some individuals who would say that, well, we're all, uh, all denominations uh, that are spread throughout the world and all these different belief systems and all these different things that are taught and all these different ways that people worship, uh, they're all irrelevant. All that we uh, all that really matters is that we believe in Christ Jesus. Well, this letter wouldn't have been written if that was the case. Uh, it was important that these individuals understood correctly. It was important that these individuals talk correctly and worship correctly. And so this letter was written largely to deal with a particular false teaching that had uh, crept into the church at Colossae regarding the, the deity and, and the humanity of Christ. Taking into account things that are written within this letter uh, as things as well as things that are written uh, in the book of Philemon uh, we gather that one of Paul's helpers that uh, by the name of Epaphras uh, someone who was converted by Paul uh, who might or might not have been one of the founders of the church of Colossae had gotten word to Paul he had informed Paul of some of the the false teaching that had crept into the congregation here uh, that false teaching revolves mainly around the idea of Gnosticism, uh, which springs from Greek polytheism and Greek philosophy, as well as a few other influences. Uh, and it had a, a couple of different flavors. The, the, the Gnostics, they had uh, little variations in, in some of their beliefs, uh, and, and it was dealt with not only in in this letter penned by Paul, but also in uh, the books of First and Second John as well. But the idea of Gnosticism had crept into the church at Colossae. And so the main idea of Gnosticism was that they saw a, a distinct separation between anything physical and anything spiritual. Uh, they viewed any physical thing anything that consisted of matter, whether it be a, a human being or an animal or, or some other inan inanimate object uh, around them, they saw every physical thing as being inherently evil. Uh, and saw any spiritual thing as being inherently good. And so seeing uh, physical things as sinful, some flavors of, of Gnostics would deprive themselves uh, of physical pleasures uh, and, and they would even deprive themselves of physical needs they would uh, do things such as starve themselves uh, they would also practice such things as as self-mutilation they would uh, inflict damage and harm to their physical body in order to try to get it to submit uh, they did other 
uh, harmful practices as far as their physical well-being is concerned in order to elevate themselves spiritually uh, according to their teaching. This is referred to in chapter 2, verse 23, as well as in other places. And so some particular flavors of Gnostics would deprive or punish themselves physically in order to elevate themselves spiritually. Uh, and, and on the other side, uh, some Gnostics took the, the very opposite approach. Since they viewed the body as evil uh, and the spirit as a separate thing from the body and the spirit as the only thing that mattered, they decided that whatever they chose to do with their bodies was irrelevant. Uh, thus, no matter what they did, according to their belief, uh, no matter what they did or did not do physically, it had no effect on their spiritual status. This flavor of Gnostic, instead of mutilating or depriving themselves, would indulge in whatever uh, they wanted to, whatever desire they had in order to gain enlightenment. So two different flavors uh, of this false doctrine. One would uh, practice self-mutilation in order to harm their bodies, uh, in order to uh, enlighten themselves spiritually, in order to separate themselves from their physical needs, their physical wants, while the other group of people would indulge in whatever they wanted to indulge in, uh, viewing their physical body as something separate than their, their spiritual soul. Uh, you can probably see, uh, if you think about that for a moment, you can see remnants of that theology, that, that idea, that false doctrine in, in some of the, the once saved, always saved denominations of the world that, that make that same separation between their spiritual well-being and their physical body, saying that no matter what they did with their body, no matter what uh, type of sinful act they engaged in that their soul was still saved because they differentiate between their body and their spirit. And so that has carried on from that idea of Gnosticism. Uh, the word Gnosticism or Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, uh, the, the word for knowledge. And so they claim to have this, to have this intimate knowledge uh, of spiritual things. This knowledge attained by rising above physical needs and desires or being able to separate themselves from physical needs, desires, pleasures, and so forth. And so the idea is that of separation between body and spirit. Uh, there are several side effects of this belief system. And some of the side effects, you know, it, it's a pretty bad thing that they engaged in. Uh, whether they be indulging in all sorts of sinful practices or depriving themselves of physical needs, uh, that's a, a thing that's dangerous to their physical well-being, uh, but even more serious than the, the consequences that they might have had physically were the consequences uh, of their spiritual well-being as a result of this belief. Uh, one side effect of this belief is that if they view all matter as something that is evil, uh, they also viewed all matter as something that was eternal. Uh, because if God is all good and matter is all evil, then God, who is all good, could not create something that was evil. And so this, this ideology affected their beliefs of creation in that they did not believe that God created the universe, uh, that he created something from nothing. They believed that it had always existed uh, or was created by some other source. Uh, and so that was one side effect of Gnosticism. Uh, another side effect that was more dangerous than that, perhaps, uh, is that it resulted in the worship of angels, uh, briefly mentioned within this letter, since they were spiritual beings and they were believed to be intermediaries between the human world, the physical world, and the spiritual world, then the, the Gnostics began to worship these individuals, or these, these beings, uh, rather than or uh, along with the one true God, which we understand to be a sinful practice in and of itself. But even more dangerous uh, than, than those two things, in, in my opinion, uh, is that when they view anything physical as evil, uh, that becomes a real problem when the word becomes flesh, such as we read in the book 
of John, the gospel of John, when the word, when Jesus Christ, when God became flesh. Uh, and so the, the most drastic, the most dangerous side effect of this belief system was that they had to either deny the humanity or the deity of Christ. And that's something that is addressed uh, to some detail within this letter. So their idea, since God cannot be sinful, he cannot be flesh. Therefore, uh, some who held these uh, ideas of Gnosticism, they either denied the humanity of Christ, they would say that he was some sort of uh, of spiritual being, yet he was not actually a, a physical human being, uh, and others denied the deity of Christ, that he was a, a good man, a good teacher, but that he was not actually God in the flesh. So some of those uh, who believe that, that Jesus wasn't actually deity or that he wasn't actually humanity, probably both of those had crept their way into the church at Colossae and had begun to, uh, to draw the brethren away with that false doctrine. And so within the book of Colossians, as we begin our study, we will read uh, language such as that in the Gospel of John uh, that, that clearly illustrates Jesus as both deity uh, and as human, uh, that he is God in the flesh and that, that he deserves the, the glory and honor that is due him. All right, so that is uh, about all that we have for this evening. As we begin to study the book of Colossians, we will study the first 12 verses of the first chapter next week. Uh, and we want to keep in mind the main theme of the letter, which is the preeminence of Christ. Uh, Paul will discuss false philosophies. He will discuss false teachers, false worship. Uh, and then, you know, as a result of their, their theology, he will also get into things that we should be doing physically, uh, the way we should behave ourselves as children of God, because all of those things are important. Uh, again, if you have any questions or comments, uh, anything that you would like for us to discuss as we go through the book of Colossians or any questions you might have, feel free to contact us anytime at Salina Church of Christ at gmail.com. Thank you.